Thank you for taking this journey with me again in our study of the Epistle of Romans. Our goal has been and continues to be to develop the mind of Christ, enabled by the Word of Christ, grounded in the Gospel of Christ. The Gospel of Christ is the source of salvation. The Word of Christ is the story of salvation. Justification is the start of salvation, and sanctification is the sustainer of salvation. Now, in this lesson, we continue our exposition of life after salvation in Romans 8, 18 through 27. Now, we're still, we're into the fifth theme of Romans 8, which is suffering. And I'm linking that to salvation, all right? Therefore, in this lesson, I am extending my exposition of the helmet of salvation into this lesson. So we're going to have a helmet of salvation part two. From the last lesson, we learn that Paul not only addresses theological aspects of salvation, but real world practical aspects as well. At the end of verse 17, Paul introduced a foreboding reality about salvation. And that was, suffering is a prima facie fact of the believing sinner's life. Now, the end of verse 17 asserts that those in Christ who are to share in his glory must also share in his suffering. In other words, he or she who picks the rose must accept the thorns it bears. Suffering is a practical issue that is part of every believing sinner's experience. Now, there was a time when it was, be when it was believed that suffering was the result of retribution by God for sin. This, I got to say, is a false assumption. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? All right, that was a long passage, but it does make the point. Those who suffer according to God's will, have to commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. One identifying feature about adoption, and that's where I'm going, is that God's children suffer. Suffering is a verifying attribute of God's heirs. All righty? I'm at point number one, the suffering, and that's at verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. All right? A question an unbeliever or a carnal Christian might ask is, what does a believer have beyond the word of God to guarantee, substantiate, and or validate the promise of salvation? And the answer is nothing. Point blank. Period. All right. Nothing beyond the word of God. 
However, the word of God is validated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus rose from the grave, the word of God, the Bible is the word of God. I've said this before, that the, that the, that the Christian faith does not rest on the Bible. The Christian faith rests on the gospel. If the gospel is true, then the Bible is true. All right? So in the last lesson, I introduced Paul's assertion in 1 Thessalonians 5.8 that the helmet of hope of salvation is the believer's protection in darkness. Now, the key word was hope. Also in the last lesson, I stated that the promise of adoption was the medal of the helmet of salvation. In this lesson, I contend that adoption and hope are both linked to salvation, together, like two sides of the same coin. Paradoxically, the helmet is designed to protect the believing sinner from the darts of sin, but not from the hardness of suffering. In fact, 2 Timothy 2.3 says, Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ. There it is right there. Another version says, Endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. So, at verse 18, Paul subtly implies that hope or confident expectation undergirds his assertion that that there is no comparison between the suffering believers now experience and the promised glory. Even if suffering could be eradicated, now he's, he's going even this far, even if there was no suffering from the believer's experience, there would still be no comparison to what, we're, what the Lord already has in store for us. He says, mine has not even conceived it. Therefore, even in the worst of experiences that we can have, we can still have hope. All right? Ironically, the hardness of suffering that a good soldier is to endure is mostly defensive in that he or she overcomes by not being overcome. That's the whole issue of here. The believer is to stand. That's what Ephesians 6 says. Stand firm against the wiles of the devil. Come on. And what, what are we going to do? Repel the enemy's assaults by standing. But now here's the other side. But not to step outside the line of our calling. Come on here. We let the enemy be the assailant and come if he will attempt or if, if, if he's going to attempt. If it's going to be any skirmish, it's going to be initiated by the enemy. But we do not go out and tempt him to do it. So, even when the enemy attacks the believer, come on, if we, even when he attacks us, the gospel does not allow us to use the enemy's weapons to return fire. Did you catch that? 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9 says, Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessings. Come on, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. All right? So, what I'm going to talk about now is three suffering groans in the scripture, starting at verse 19, all right? Groaning, I want to say this, is an incoherent sound associated with misery. Now, that's my definition of groaning. So, I'm at point number two. The suffering or groaning of the solar system. Verses 19 through 22 said, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him 
who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage of corruption or bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. All right? So, in verses 19 through 22 here, Paul expands the discussion to assert the suffering and groaning of creation. And he says, creation also waits for glorification. Come on. The cursing of creation is attributed to the fall of humankind or the fall of Adam. All right. And the sin of humankind, come on, a sin of Adam, continues to subject creation to corruption and disturb its tranquility. Creation now was victimized and subjected to frustration because, again, I'm coming back to it, Adam's sin. Paradoxically now, God cursed the ground, not Adam. Read, go back and read that again. As such, creation cannot produce or reproduce as it was originally designed. Now, that's interesting considering we get everything from creation. So, severe storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, floods, droughts, earthquakes, pestilence, etc. are evidence of the frustration of creation. So, now, and also, in the animal kingdom, I like animal shows, the struggle for survival and the violence of the ecosystem and the predatory lifestyle of the food chain is evidence of the frustration of creation. The four seasons, let's, let, you know, we're, we're, getting, we're coming into fall as I do this lesson. The four seasons have been described as an aborted, annual attempt by creation to restore itself, but these attempts fail year after year. So, creation is groaning to be delivered, but the deliverance for creation is connected to human deliverance. The curse of creation now is universal. And now I want to say it, it's a universal principle. Guess what? Due to sin that corrupted the human nature. The same sin that corrupted us, corrupted creation. Come on. Now, but the sanctifying grace that we're talking about now, life after salvation, is also a universal principle that renews believing sinners immediately, but not wholly. We're not, we're, we're, we're saved. But we haven't realized. Come on, let's keep going. That's what we're dealing with in this adoption. It's getting good right through here. Grace comes into the soul as the soul comes into the body. It grows by steps, but it is born at once. We were born in a world full human being. Think about this. The new creature, one that has just been born, has all his or her parts form together, but not at full maturity. Think about this now. The world was discovered progressively, some parts after others, but the whole earth was made at the same time. Christ has come. Let's, let's, let's pull, pull, pull the link together. And I, and I, and I, but as identified in Isaiah 11, 1 through 11, and Revelation 1, you got to go back and read that. All creation is waiting for the full consummation. All right? So I'm at point number three. The suffering or groaning of saints. I'm at verses 23 through 25. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. 
For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it patiently. All right. Now, in verses 23 through 25, Paul completes his discussion of the theology and practical reality of adoption and its connection with hope as a confident expectation of a tangible bodily redemption as, well, guess what? Protection for the mind and conscience in the anatomy of salvation. All in that, this is what he's doing. He, he's tying this all together. All right? So, as the helmet defends the head, which is the principal part of the body, so hope, so the hope of salvation defends the soul which is the principal part of every human being. Every person, knowingly or unknowingly, has been affected by the fall of humankind. The effect of sin will cause every person sooner or later to groan in his or her body. Come on. At verse 23, the Holy Spirit is the believer's help by being, guess what, the first fruit, not to be confused with the fruit of the Spirit. Paul completes, I say again, his discussion on adoption and the hope of salvation by asserting that the Holy Spirit does an initial work and an ultimate work in the salvation of the believer. Come on here. The spiritual salvation is the initial work. This is the first fruits. The physical salvation is the ultimate work. That's the final harvest. Now come on. The Holy Spirit's first fruits ministry in salvation are one, he has drawn us, the believer, to the Father. Two, he has testified to us believers and sinners about Jesus Christ. Three, he has convicted believing sinners in the word. Come on. Four, he has baptized the believing sinner into union with Christ. Five, he indwells, leads, keeps, and fills the believing sinner. Come on here. Now number six, he has adopted the believing sinner and testifies to us that he or she is God's child. And seven, he bestows spiritual gifts and helps a believer develop Christ-like characteristics to conform that believing sinner to Christ and to develop the mind of Christ, which is the goal of our whole study. Come on. Now, since the believer has received the first fruits, he or she can have hope, which is confident expectation for the accomplishment of the ultimate ministry, physical resurrection, the believer's ultimate adoption, and the redemption of the believer's body. So, altogether, the Holy Spirit is the agent of salvation in saving, delivering, and and preserving, and adoption is the helmet of the hope of salvation that defends the soul by providing protection and safety for the mind, will, emotions, and conscience of the believing sinner. Hope is a grace that the believing sinner will need until God calls him or her off earth's battlefield. The believing sinner, this keeps going, is commanded to take the helmet of salvation, not for one occasion, but for life. Literally, un until God takes this helmet off and replaces it with a crown. Come on here. I want to say this, after being in the Navy. Some war equipment is used only now and then. But 1 Peter 1.13 says, 
Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope, there that word, there's that word again, fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right? Now I'm at point number four. The suffering or groaning of the Spirit. Verses 26 through 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. All right, now that's, that's a beautiful text right there. So in verses 26 and 27, Paul asserts that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for the believing sinner. That's us, all right? Since the Holy Spirit is with us, come on, think about this. Why is prayer necessary? Holy Spirit indwells us. He fills us. I just talked about that in the last section. So why is prayer necessary? Prayer is necessary because communion with God is crucial for the believing sinner to maintain and sustain hope through faith and a good conscience. Come on here. Faith and a good conscience are key elements of godliness and holiness which are essential to fighting the good fight. That's over there in 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19. Come on. To be part of any army. Come on. Every unit must communicate with headquarters. Now that's just natural. The ministry of prayer is a moral spiritual ministry. Prayer is a divine appointment for the believing sinner to check in, guess for, for healing, sustaining, guiding, and reconciling. Prayer is what focuses and refocuses the believing sinner's thinkings, thinking, feelings, and decisions and brings them into submission to God. God commands the believer to pray and expects the believer's obedience. Now, we've been told to pray. Pray without ceasing. Prayer is also directly linked to one's ability to find meaning, purpose, value, and direction because prayer sets the believer near to God. Come on here. The believer's problem, now here's our problem with prayer and all of it, is that he or she needs the Holy Spirit's help. We can't do this on our own. We can't do anything on our own, by the way. There are three reasons identified in Psalm 103, 13 through 16 as to why the Holy Spirit helps the believer. One, he knows our formation or he knows our frame. We are corrupted with a sinful nature. Two, he remembers we are dust. We are mortal. Uh, come on, we're mortal. All right? And three, he knows we are frail. Our time is limited. Ironically, God remembers what the believer forgets. That's our healing, sustaining, guiding, reconciling, which is moral and physical weakness. That's our problem. While the believer remembers what God forgets, the sin of guilt, shame, filth, and blame. He forgives us and cleanses us of that in prayer. Therefore, the Holy Spirit prays for the believer himself because, one, the believer does, first of all, we don't even know what to pray for due to what? Our limited vision and perspective. And two, the believer's understanding is hindered because of the adversarial influence of our sinful nature. Because why? It will not cooperate. We already learned up in, in Romans 8, 5, it's hostile. Three, the Holy Spirit can express what the believer cannot put into words. Come on. 
For, and another reason is, Satan accuses the believer continuously in heaven. And his, and his accusations are accurate. Come on, so you, we need a defense. Five, the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God, so his prayer will be in perfect harmony with the will of God. The groaning of the Holy Spirit on the believer's behalf, which is in accordance with God's will, not only ensures that one's needs will be heard, but that it will be answered. All right, that's a whole lot, but we're, we're stopping here. In the next lesson, we will continue our comparison of the themes in Romans 8 and the armor in Ephesians 6, all right? We're going to continue to do that. Again, the gospel of Christ is the ground and foundation for the word of Christ that enables the mind of Christ. So for homework, continue reading Romans 8. May God bless and keep you. Amen, amen, and amen.